plan for the session is as follows. I will give you some brief background on how we developed the form. Then you will get to play around with the form and maybe do a sort of quick and dirty qualitative pre-registration in small groups. And then we wrap up so we can share some of our experiences and hopefully there'll be plenty of time uh, for an actual discussion. So with that, let me just share my screen. All right, so like you said before, um, my work and my interest is really very much building on on this paper that I wrote together with Leonie van Gautel, who was at that point affiliated with Tilburg University in the Netherlands. And in this paper, it was much more of a sort of conceptual exercise that we did. We saw that there was increased interest in quantitative pre-registration. And we really tried to see, okay, can this in some way also be applied to qualitative pre-registration and qualitative research? What would the sort of typical uh, objections be that people would have? Can we rebut them? And I think to some extent we can. And then we ended with some conclusions on, okay, what would be the sort of first things that would need to be changed or what could a pre-registration form potentially look like? But bear in mind, these were only suggestions. And when OSF tried to, to put these into a form and put them on their website, I may actually felt a little bit uncomfortable because we were like, look, these were our ideas and obviously we thought about them. But ideally, if you, if you develop a form to benefit a community, you involve that community in what you are doing. So from January to April this year, I've worked at the Centre for Open Science as a scholar in residence. And the goal of my residency was to develop this qualitative pre-registration form. And I want to emphasize I did not do this alone. Um, the people you see here on this slide are my steering committee and have been very knowledgeable and helpful uh, during this whole study exercise. So on the top left, you see Rafael Pinero and Fernando Rosenblatt. They wrote a very interesting paper on pre-analysis plans for qualitative research. And then you see Fernando Ken and Christian Gladich. They disseminate a very helpful preprint on qualitative pre-registration. On the bottom left for me, the man with the glasses is Alan Jacobs. And he wrote on pre-registration and publication bias in qualitative research. Next to him is Leonie van Gaat, who is my co-author. Uh, then a man in the middle may be familiar to some of you, it's Brian Nosek, the executive director of the Center for Open Science. To his right is Tim Errington, Director of Research at the Centre for Open Science, and Yinika Mocking, all the way at the right, who helped us with Delphi methodology. So the structure of this brief presentation will be as follows. I'll quickly flash out the relevance of qualitative pre-registration. Why should we do this study? Um, I'll go about what this Delphi study looked like, including how we recruited panelists and how we created the first questionnaire what our results look like from the first and the second round, and then I hope we have some time for a brief discussion and look into some of the next steps. So I think qualitative pre-registering can be relevant because it, and it, it could potentially strengthen the credibility and transparency of qualitative research. And with this, I really mean that there, there are two ways to go about this. And the first one is, you know, this pre-registration is, is putting things in a sort of public repository and the openness of this information about the study that could encourage the researcher to carefully reflect on, on different study aspects and to systematically report on their design and analysis choices, including those of their major study progressors. And the second being that these records about the study design and the analysis plan help the reviewer or the user of the study in assessing the study's quality because the pre-registration provides a structured insight into how the study was thought out and set up. Now, when I started this project, the importance of pre-registration was increasingly recognized by different stakeholders. And with that, I mean that there are now some funders that require your research to be pre-registered, like the Arnold Foundation, but it's also increasingly encouraged by journals or disciplinary organizations like the EPA. Um, but before we move any further, you may say, hold on, isn't qualitative pre-registration inherently counterintuitive? Qualitative methodology is so flexible, what could you possibly pre-register? And to that I want to say, look, a precise specification of all the intended analyses and all the parameters, and that is indeed unrealistic for qualitative research. But there may be information that is meaningful to pre-register. For example, how to gauge a qualitative research question and this can help providing, in providing this systematic insight into the qualitative inquiry decisions, 
or into which methodological shifts occurred and why these were justified. And as I said, when we, when we started this project, that being different authors that had put forth ideas, but there had been no involvement with the community that was supposed to, to, to benefit from this form eventually, that being no empirical investigation. Uh, so the goal of my residency really was, you know, involve this community in trying to attain consensus among their members on which items to include in a qualitative pre-registration form. And we did so using a Delphi study. And I think a Delphi here is appropriate because as I said, there are a few papers on the topic. And Delphi is a sort of structured group communication method to, to find a set of items that the community agreed upon. And in a nutshell, a Delphi really is consecutive questionnaires with feedback reports in between. And everybody gets, the feed, gets to see the feedback from everybody else. And the idea is that this is helpful because you can reach out to an otherwise much dispersed group. And because it's in, it, people give their feedback and arguments in an anonymous fashion, it is thought that there's not one person that can really dominate the debate. So our exact design is given in this little flowchart. You can see we had a preparatory phase and two rounds that together fat into this final pre-registration form. Now, we put together a pool of panelists using a full fault strategy. Uh, first, I asked steering committee members to put four suitable colleagues, people whom they knew to be knowledgeable on the topic. Um, we also approached authors of reporting guidelines for qualitative research. And we supplemented that with what I've labeled here active qualitative researchers. And we did a, a broad search in both Scopus and Web of Science to see, okay, what, who are the people that have published at least four papers using qualitative methodology in the last four years? And we use that as a sort of proxy for active qualitative researchers. And in NVTs could suggest colleagues or recommend people that may be interested in taking part. So it led to a potential pool of 294 NVTs. And we created the questionnaire also using a full fold approach. Uh, first, I integrated the existing works by steering committee members. I also did a systematic search in both PubMed and PsycInfo looking for key terms like qualitative research and pre-registration. I then uh, supplemented that by screening all of the 21 reporting guidelines for qualitative research that can be found on the Equator platform. Now, some of you may be familiar with the COREC or the JAS for EPA, those sort of guidelines. And that led to, to a sort of list of 36 proposals that I then discussed with the steering committee members. Um, and we tried to condense them and make them more clear and consistent, which led to a total of 21 proposals. And with proposal, I mean a proposed term with a suggested elaboration for that term. So here you can see what our first iteration looked like. On the left column, you can see the different headings for the form. So here we're under the heading of design plan. And then the term would be study type. And the elaboration is what starts with please describe. Now, participants also saw this, but then we asked them the following questions. And we asked them to indicate to what extent they agree with the suggested term, with the suggested elaboration, whether they thought that this item was actually relevant for qualitative pre-registration, and whether they thought this heading was intuitive, because we wanted to make a form that was easy or intuitive to, to navigate for participants. And he indicated their agreement on a scale from five, being strongly agreed to one, strongly disagree. And very importantly, we asked them to provide arguments for their ratings or give us an alternative term or propose something to add to the elaboration. Now, Adelphi seeks to establish consensus that makes it very important to define upfront what your consensus criterion is. So here we said that at least 68% of the panel members had to agree, indicated they strongly agree or somewhat agreed for us to say, okay, they're on board with this, we'll continue with this item. Now, in round one, there were 39 researchers that completed a questionnaire and there were, out of our 21 proposals, there were 14 that they actually considered relevant. But oftentimes they said, look, these things may be tapping into highly similar issues, maybe you can combine them. So we merged them into 11 revised proposals and then there were two proposals that had just somewhat lower scores, 66% relevant, 65% relevant, um, but they had very much conflicting arguments. And with that, I mean that some people were very pro-including and others were very contra-including. So we revised those two and put them forth again to check what the panel really wanted. So you can see a demo of our second iteration. 
Now you see a revised term, this time we use the term study design, and a revised elaboration that starts with please indicate. And this time around, we only asked participants to rate to what extent they agreed with the revised term. And the term was then revised based on their arguments. So they saw the old term, the new term, and a summary of their key arguments and how we interpreted them to get to this new or revised term. And the same for the elaboration. And again, we asked them, please, you know, rate, but also provide arguments, tell us how we can improve. And in the second round, there were 35 researchers that took part in the questionnaire. And out of our 11 revised terms, they see they were on board with already 10 of them, but one needed to be substantially revised, the others only slightly. Um, and a somewhat similar picture for the elaborations. And the two other items that we had revised did turn out to be actually relevant. They were added to the form in their revised version. So the final form consists of 13 items. And we thought it was nice to briefly show what this then would look like. So here on this picture, you can see that in round one, we presented a suggested term called sampling strategy. Arguments, but these are some of the arguments where I made bold what I thought was particularly, what we thought was particularly important that helped us to get to this new revised term, which is case selection strategy. Then we again got a host of very interesting arguments and that led to a final version that now reads sampling and case selection strategy and a brief elaboration. You will see all of them uh, later. So to wrap up, we developed a consensus-based form for prerequisite qualitative research. And I think it's pivotal to assure that the strength of qualitative research, which in my view at least is precisely its ability to adapt, to adjust, to respond, is not lost in pre-registration. And it need not be, because analogous to quantitative pre-registration, it is, it is a plan ultimately, it's not a prison. Um, I also want to emphasize that the use of this form is absolutely voluntary. Um, and that the pre-registration should provide a systematic starting point, but that it needs to be updated as the study evolves. So I tend to think of full transparency as something that can be reached um, where then the pre-registration is a sort of systematic starting point of our evolution and the, the, the publication is a sort of point in time where we are now. But there's a lot of things that happen in between that may also be important to fully comprehend uh, what the study is about and how it has been done. Now, I am much aware that qualitative research is a very diverse area and that this form may not be optimally suited for every study because it's a consensus based form. Um, so we encourage scholars to propose what I've labeled here extra modules um, that could be added to the form, but that would be relevant for their specific type of inquiry. So here I have approaches in mind like process tracing that may be able to define much more precise evidence criteria before starting their, their data collection. And maybe this is a no-brainer, but I do want to flash it out here. There is, of course, at this point, no empirical evidence that pre-registering uh, your qualitative study will lead to a higher study quality, um, whatever that may be. And of course, the form is only just done, and it raises a host of different questions as to what would be uh, a useful way to do that. Uh, but I think what we mostly need now is to get good examples of qualitative pre-registration that interested scholars or researchers can then use as inspiration uh, or when they would try, want to try to pre-register their work. So let me end with some next steps. As I said before, the preprint of this work will be online somewhere in the next month, most likely on SOC Archive. And meanwhile, the engineers at COS are working hard to integrate the form into the OSF workflow. Uh, meaning that when a user wants to pre-register a study, the version that I just presented will be listed on the menu, as you see it here. And the other step is, of course, is, you know, familiarizing this with the community and also building a community of people who are potentially enthusiastic about this and who want to promote the practice, who want to educate others about it, or who may want to critically evaluate its effects. Um, I want to take a very brief moment, but a very important one, to acknowledge all the panel members who voluntarily and without any compensation uh, gave me an hour or sometimes one and a half hours of their time. That's how long these questionnaires take. And this would absolutely not have been possible without them. And also COS for, for having me and for agreeing to, to integrate this form into their workflow, because I believe it's an important step in, in broadening also what open science is or can be. Um, 
So with that, I actually wanted, you, wanted to invite you to first go explore with this form for yourself. So I've also asked Brechia, Maurits and Vera before me if people have any idea or they have a sort of qualitative study in mind that they would potentially like to pre-register, um, this is your time. that we're almost nearly complete. Um, a couple of things I learned from dropping into rooms was one very important question uh, about, okay, but how would you then do this updating? What if I change my recruitment strategy? Or what if my research question gets changed? And then I explained how this is possible at this point um, at the OSF. And I will give this link to Brechie to the guideline that explains that process so she can hopefully forward it to, to all of you uh, later. But maybe we could do a sort of quick round of, of your experiences or any questions you may have. You can also type them in the chat. Um, I'm happy either way. That is exactly what pre-registration can be so helpful for. And I've heard in other groups as well, it can be a very time consuming and extensive exercise, but it can help you to, to come to terms already with a lot of things you may otherwise have to think of later on. And especially if you may be a beginning researcher, um, that could be very helpful. As I said before, I quite like it also as a, as a reader or when I'm reviewing papers and something is pre-registered, I always go back to it and I sort of go check and see, okay, what has happened in this study? What has the evolution been? And can I find justifications for changes that have been made? Because they can be so informative, especially for qualitative research. They're, they're, they shouldn't be scored as sort of mistakes, but as maybe lessons learned along the way. And I realize that's a very uncomfortable way of phrasing maybe for the more quantitatively oriented among us, but I truly believe that that's where I can bring it to added value. And then to, um, I'm familiar with the research log and, you know, I actively encourage that practice. And I think by, um, by sort of making a pre-registration public, you are in a way more encouraged as a researcher to be very consistent also with that research log. Because there is some way in which at some point you have to spin all these loose ends back together because people knew what you were initially after and now they see this. Um, so I've always thought that to be particularly helpful because what can happen is you start very dedicatedly with your research log, but then there are points you lose or insights you lose. And by, by knowing that that information is public, it, it helps some people at least to even be more committed with keeping track. Um, but I also realize that's my view and that may be a controversial view, but that's how I would respond. Are there any other questions or maybe things that have been unclear in what I've presented or in what we've, what we've done? Thank you. And it's, it's a very good question for clarification because what we did at the sort of credibility strategies elaboration is that we tried to, to assemble as many sort of things that were known in the literature as credibility strategies or something different. And we put them all together to give researchers an indication, okay, hey, maybe this is something you typically use and here's where you could indicate it. So some of those are you know, relatively broadly understood. So when I'm thinking about maybe member checking, um, that's relatively straightforward. People that do member checking 
you know, give their interviewees normally a summary or even the whole transcript and they give them the option to respond. So that could just be a sort of check the box thing. Um, but some of them need and they may be a little bit more of a longer reply. And some of them may also not speak to you because I think that qualitative research has a host of different traditions and have had a very eclectic mix presented for you there because we wanted to be very inclusive. So some of those may, you know, not be familiar to you, but may resonate very well with others. So don't be scared by seeing terms as examples that you. And to your specific point of reflexivity, because I find it interesting that you raised that one, because it corresponds already a little bit with what we've indicated in the question below that, which is the reflection on your positionality. But there are some areas, especially in more sociologically oriented qualitative research, where people may prefer to use the term reflexivity and it's very related to positionality, but it's not the same thing. Um, so we've included it here as well as a credibility strategy um, to allow people to give that sort of own interpretation. And this is also one of the points that I'm still hoping to fix with the sort of good examples, because you can tell people, hey, explain this in three sentences or refer to a paper where this is very well explained. Um, but that may not always be feasible. So to some extent, I'm not in a position now to fully answer your question. I think succinctness and brevity are great virtues, but it will also need a lot of piloting to find out, okay, how can I write this down condensedly, but that people still understand what I'm after. So this is half a question and half an answer. I'm sorry. Um, excellent question. And I wish I could, but I would get a lot of very angry ethical review boards. Um, that's the first part of the answer. And the second part of the answer is that this was a point that was actually also raised during the panel. Um, and I discussed it with COS because I said, look, this is not just the case for qualitative pre-registration, this is also quantitative pre-registration. A lot of people are doing studies with human beings or, you know, maybe animals or whatever that you may want to pre-register. This should be more broadly available. Um, and what they are working on now is to make that into sort of meta fields. So just like that they will ask you, oh, what's the title of your pre-registration? What's your authorship? There will also be a question about, okay, um, have you submitted this study for ethical review? And if so, how and what? So it's going to be there in a sort of more standardized form. And that's why I decided to take it out of here, because otherwise it would be uh, double and potentially then more confusing to users. I think I'm also seeing a question in the chat and it's about whether you can export the pre-registration to PDF. Yes, you can. And when it gets integrated um, into OSF, it will just be a sort of automatic form where you can just fill in boxes, but you can then also download it as a sort of uh, a PDF now. I've deliberately not made it into such at this point, because as I said, you are the very first group I'm showing this with. This is my new baby and I'm happy you didn't burn it down. Um, so, it's, it's going to come out as a preprint and then this will also be added as a, as a PDF and that will probably be anywhere next month. Um, I think I'm seeing another comment from Malika about how some of the sections could also be added to the quantitative pre -reg. Um I love that comment. I've said that to many people and not everyone agrees with me. Um, but it's also something I, I've been uh, discussing and I would love to hear uh, your views as well because initially um, when I was thinking about this and when I was designing this, uh, a lot of objections that we also talk about in the 2019 paper could equally be made to, to sort of quantitative research. And it resonates a lot with the sort of thing I said earlier, like it, it's a plan, it's not a prison. Um, it's just that here we are even, we're, we're even, we would be surprised if you pre-register a qualitative study and nothing changes altogether over the course of your research. Where maybe with quantitative research, that would be a sort of wow, wonderful thing, and you've been so thorough and so consistent. In qualitative research, that would probably raise some eyebrows. Um, but I definitely think that there are parts in there that, that overlap. And that's also why I still feel comfortable calling it a pre-registration, because we've had some discussions, like are we not doing a different thing altogether? And ultimately, I think we, we don't. So I'm happy to, to read your comments. Uh, 
Um, some thoughts. And I think, uh, first of all, it's a personal preference thing. I really think it's a strong personal preference thing, so I'm not going to give any sort of very concrete guidance. What we try to do, especially in sort of items about study design, is phrasing them in a way to invite people, okay, if they're quantitative and qualitative parts, so, you know, basically lending a hand to the mixed methods folks, um, this may be the part where you define that, because oftentimes when you do mixed methods, the sort of more unfamiliar stuff will be the qualitative stuff, and that could then still be indicated on this form. But I am, I'm not going to say that it will, uh, you know, apply across the board and it probably takes, you know, new clever people to think of a way of at some point designing uh, mixed methods pre-registrations. Because it's also it's an area that I know a little bit about, but I also wouldn't feel comfortable to, to fully give you a, an answer that I stand by. is very positive about your workshop in the chat. <laughs> That's good to know. I'll just leave my email address in the chat in case people still have direct questions and I wish all of you a very good day. Yes, thank you so much. Bye.